Well, good morning. Um, once again, we start off uh, prayer and sermon. We're going to have the Lord's Supper towards the end. But I want to use this morning's lesson as a combination sermon, Lord's Supper talk. Um, we not only set our clocks forward this morning, but uh, I've been told California has uh, entered into that red tier. Um, I know that opens some things up slowly. And so um, this week, um, I'm hoping to begin a discussion, at least begin the, the uh, uh, we want to bring back at least, at least a Sunday morning Bible class. And so we're going to um, be trying to get some feedback as to, most importantly, when you as parents feel comfortable and how you would feel comfortable and maybe when you'd feel comfortable um, with kids in a classroom setting and what that would look like. Um, and so I put that out there. Um, I want, we need input. Um, we need to hear opinions, no matter what they are. Um, as we move forward. And so I appreciate that. Um, I also put this out there. If there is someone that would rather than me um, take on that discussion and lead that discussion, um, I would be more than happy to have someone um, take charge of that. So, uh, but it, barring that, um, I will try to do my best to try to fill out the congregation and see as... Uh, we move forward when we can open that up. So, um, again, this is going to be a sermon that is kind of designed for the Lord's Supper talk this morning. Um, and I ask you, can you hear the music? And maybe that will jog your memory, maybe it won't. It's The music is getting louder, and it's getting louder, and it's almost at that crescendo and of course, what we've been doing from time to time is looking at the Gospel of John and how John builds faith almost like a beautiful piece of music that's written like a crescendo where it starts off soft and gets louder and louder. And uh, at this point, we've been looking at the miracles of John. And these are the primary way, at least one of the primary ways that John is trying to build faith in Jesus. You see, John's point is, it's not just to believe in Jesus, you have to believe accurately of who Jesus is. Your faith has to be rock solid on the truth and reality of Jesus. It's not enough to believe that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have to understand what that means accurately. And there were many in the days of Jesus that did not. And there are many today that will openly confess Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but not really understand what that is. I am challenged every day to live a life of understanding of those facts. I am not perfect in that either. So we talked about the first six handpicked miracles of John, and now we've left the seventh for this one lesson. This, this seventh miracle is an amazing miracle. And interestingly, it's not recorded by any of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not record this, this miracle. And the miracle we're going to look at today is found in John chapter 11, if we want to begin turning there. And is the raising of Lazarus. In fact, the interesting thing as well is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke mention Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, but make no mention of Lazarus, the brother. He's completely left out with one exception. And we'll talk about that one exception, which is in the Gospel of Luke towards the end of our lesson. 
But John decides before I talk about the greatest miracle of them all, the resurrection of Jesus, where Jesus is raised himself, I'm going to talk about Jesus raising someone else. And in that miracle, John wants to paint one more picture about what we need to understand and believe about Jesus. As you can see the title up here, we need to believe and understand what it means when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's our Lord's Supper talk this morning. I am the resurrection and the life. Do we truly understand what that statement means? I know we believe in it. I know we are gathered today to proclaim it, but do we understand it? And so as we get going this morning, we've been talking about in these six miracles, what problems people have that bring them down in life, what, the, the complaints that people have, the, the times and, and things that, that make people to give up in this life. And so sometimes we, we hear people say, well, it's just not good enough. That, that, that solution's just not enough. It's, it's just not going to be enough. Or something like this. Well, it's just too far. It's just too far. I can't have that as my solution. It's too far. Or it's just not enough. Just not enough. It's not good enough. It's not enough. Or it's just been too long. N nothing can change. Or something like this. It's just too difficult. Or ultimately, all these put together, it might lead people to say it's just hopeless. One of the sad realities about the COVID pandemic is there has been a rise in suicide. Where people have given up, believing it's hopeless. But what we are learning these miracles, in each of these, Jesus is the solution. It's not a problem for Jesus. He has the power over quality and quantity. He has the power and authority over power and distance and time and space. Nothing is difficult. Nothing is impossible. And therefore, nothing should be hopeless when we turn and believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. But before we actually get into John chapter 11, the miracle itself, as we've been talking about, John is developing this faith through these miracles. And through other means, we looked at the Old Testament word pictures and we'll look at a, another aspect of John and how he builds faith. But in these miracles, what we're seeing is that the challenges that Jesus has in trying to build faith in trying to get people to believe in him are not just from the unbelievers. Let me say that again. Jesus' challenges did not just come from those who refused to believe. And that's the, the picture John is painting. And that's a reality, unfortunately, in the world today, in, in many churches, the challenge of those churches is not just from unbelievers, but from believers. Believers not believing as they should. So one of the groups that, that John has shown us is that there is a group that believes in Jesus. They, 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 they have been excited about Jesus. They've been following Jesus, but only look at Jesus as someone that can solve their physical problems. They are completely absent of any spiritual desires or spiritual interests. In knowing those things. And Jesus has told them. That's not what I came here for. That's not what it means. When, when you say I am the Christ. The son of the living God. But there, there are people today. That only turn to Jesus. Because of what he can provide for them physically. They, they just don't understand. The greater spiritual side of Jesus. But that, that is a faith. But it's not the faith that Jesus came to rest people's goals and desires on and hopes. 
There's another group that he's talked about, and that is that this this group that believe. Well, yes, Jesus can heal, but they place the limitation that he has to be present in order to do that. Jesus, come quickly to save my servant, or to save my son. Come to my house. And so there's belief, but not a full understanding of who Jesus really is. And now we're going to get into John 11, and we're going to see the final group. And what I want to say about this final group, and why I think it is such a, a great lesson for us, is that it is a group that believes in Jesus. And in fact, get this, I believe this is the group that is probably the strongest, most faithful group of Jesus' disciples. It would include his apostles, but others. These are people that believe that Jesus can heal. He can solve the problem, but only if someone is living. Once someone's dead, that's it. Jesus can't do anything anymore. And I believe that's the point John's bringing home. That's just simply not true. And so we have these, these, these disciples who believe in Jesus, but they don't quite understand to what extent they can believe in him. They believe in him, but with limits. And with that understanding, let's take a look at some of the strongest disciples of Jesus in John chapter 11. As Jesus, not just John, but Jesus is trying to build faith in him. Trying to get people to understand his true power and authority is limitless. And so we begin in John chapter 11 and in verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Martha who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So the first thing that we have, we have introduced to us Lazarus, but he's in a bad condition. He is sick. He is about to die. It is an urgent matter. And so here are his sisters, Mary and Martha. And, and again, let me reiterate, I believe that Mary and Martha are probably some of the most dedicated, most faithful disciples that Jesus has. If women were called to be apostles, I believe Mary and Martha would have been the James and John of the apostles. They would have been there. In fact, as, as, as Lazarus is sick, they have enough faith to what? Will you do what you, when someone gets sick, really sick, what do you, you call the doctor? And that's what they do. They call the great physician. They call Jesus. Quickly, have him come to us. But here's the thing. It was faith that knew the great physician could do something. But as we're going to learn it's going to be with limits. It appears that what they want as they send their messengers to find Jesus, to let them know about Lazarus, is they want Jesus to come and to be physically present. That's the first limit. Now the story shifts like a movie to another scene. To the other part of the story, where is Jesus? And now we shift to Jesus who has been staying out of Judea. And he's with his apostles because things have really heated up. And they want to kill Jesus down in Judea. So let's take a look, if you would, in verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. It's kind of what we saw in John chapter 9 with the healing of the blind man, where they ask, who, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? And, and Jesus says, no, 
he was born blind so that you will see the work of God, the works of God, and therefore you will see the glory of God. You have that kind of same theme here. But it's interesting. I want you to notice this. Did you see it in verse 4? This sickness is not to end in death. Keep that in your mind. The ultimate result of this sickness, like the blind man, like these, uh, these works, these miracles, is for the glory of God. So in verse 5 we learn, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, so get this. Jesus loves them. And Jesus has just learned that he is sick and about to die. So what is his reaction? Verse 6. So when he heard that he was sick, then he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that, he, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And look at verse 15. Jesus says, and I am glad. Now that's not all he says, but he says, I'm glad. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Uh, what I see in this story is that here you have Jesus, and, and what does John set up? John sets up that Jesus loves Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and when he finds out that Lazarus is about to die, and that he can do something, he does what any loving person does, he waits. And as a result of him waiting, Lazarus dies. And then he says, I'm glad he's dead. You see, this, this, this is a story where Jesus has a goal. Jesus is building faith first here with the apostles. But to build faith in who Jesus was and to bring out the spiritual side of all of this and his power and his strength, Jesus acts in a way that doesn't seem to be very loving. When you find out one of your loved ones is sick and in the hospital, you don't wait. You go to them. You take action. You get there as soon as you can. If you've got to book a flight, you book a flight. If you've got to pay some extra money, you pay some extra money because you've got to get there. That's not what Jesus does. He's not acting in a very loving way. And when Lazarus dies, he says, I'm glad. Now, obviously we know. He is not glad that Lazarus died, but he's glad because now he has an opportunity to truly reveal one of the most important things about faith in Jesus. But Jesus said it wasn't going to end in death. But Lazarus died. And that's the point. That's the reason for the delay. We're going to set this up in such a way that people are going to see and they need to understand and they need to know 
that when someone dies, it may seem hopeless to us. It may seem the end of the world. It may seem like the worst thing that could ever happen. But in God's eyes, it's none of those things. It's none of those things when you really understand that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I'm not going to ask you if you believe that. I know you believe it, but do you understand it? So Jesus goes now, and the apostles don't quite understand. They thought he was holding back because of the danger to the life threat. But now Lazarus is dead. Why would we go? And that's what Jesus is explaining. Just because he's dead doesn't mean I can't do something. And so, let's now turn to John 11, and let's go to verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. I want to stop right there just for a second. There is on our website, if you go to the left, you'll notice a bunch of buttons, and, and one of those buttons is more videos. And you hit on that, there, it'll take you to this page, and there's a certain, um, certain videos there that, that are just kind of random videos, I think, that are fun to preach and important for people and kind of challenge people's faith. And one of those lessons about Jesus being resurrected on the third day. I've done it here. You might remember that sermon, maybe not. Have you ever asked yourself why Jesus had to be raised on the third day? Why not the fourth? Why not the fifth? Sixth? You probably never considered that. You might just think, well, that, that's because it was after the Sabbath. But there's more to it than that. In essence, in the Jewish mindset... The decaying process, I'm not talking about medical minds, I'm talking about the Jewish mindset. Decaying of a body started on day four. When a person was really dead, day four. And there's a significance to that. What, what are the women doing to Jesus in the tomb on the third day? They're coming to the tomb. They're going to open the tomb. They're going to anoint his body with spice. They don't do that day four, day five, day six. Day... That's when the decaying of the body starts. That's significant. So let's, let's put that in order because the delay was not just to have Lazarus dead, but to come to him on the fourth day. That's what I'm trying to say. Verse 18, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had had come to Martha and Mary and to console them concerning their brother. And Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Now, we have, a, again, something that's a little bit odd. What do you know about Mary and Martha? Right? Mary is always right there with Jesus. She's at the feet of Jesus. She chooses the better part, as Jesus said. But here we have Martha comes to Jesus and Mary stays home. And so here comes Martha. And Martha then says in verse 21, look at this. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here we have faith. Great faith in Jesus. You could heal him, but now you can't. If you had been here, he would not have died. We know you would have been the hero of the day. But notice verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Now I'm not quite sure what she's referring to, but notice, even now I know whatever you ask God, he will give you. But she's not thinking physical resurrection. That becomes evident as, as we look at here. She's thinking afterlife. And so in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know. 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. When she thinks of resurrection, where does her mind go? The last day. At the end. Not here and now, not, not in the physical present world. In the last day. But look at what Jesus says, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. He will live even if he dies. Verse 26, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. It's easy to confess that, right? She believes that with all her heart, but she doesn't understand it yet. As we'll see in a few verses. She has no idea what Jesus is talking about. And that's one of the things we'll, we'll, we'll discuss in the Gospel of John. In these conversations that Jesus has, he's up on a spiritual plane. He's talking about spiritual things. And they don't understand a word of it. There's a disconnect. I want to ask you. When you hear the message, the spiritual message, is there a disconnect with you? That can change. But you have to become that spiritual thinker. And so you have this wonderful statement. And, and, and what I would have you do, if you haven't done it, highlight verse 25. Put a, put a star, put whatever you can to draw your attention. Because that's the verse that explains this whole miracle, this whole story. This is our Lord's Supper talk for this morning. Even if you die, you will live. One of the great things about Jesus is he wants us to, to not fear the very thing that people fear sometimes the most, and that is death. I mean, even to the apostles, what did he, he didn't talk about they're going to die. He said, Lazarus is asleep. And that's the, 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 the picture that the New Testament paints for us. That death, the way that God wants us to look at it, the way we could look at it with Jesus in our life, is that what? With death is we fall asleep. And then one day we wake up. And we'll wake up in a place that we can't even imagine. If you're afraid of dying, come to Jesus. He wants to take that fear away, but it takes that faith. And here's Martha, one of the, the strongest disciples he has. And what? She's got great faith. She confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it needs to grow even stronger. I want to ask you, how about your faith? So verse 28, when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and they went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. In other words, Mary comes to Jesus, but she's not alone. And therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him, and there it is. She fell at his feet. There she is, her common position, the feet of Jesus. Saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now Mary comes and we have this deja vu moment. She says the exact same thing as Martha. She has the exact kind of faith. If you were here, we know you'd be the hero. If you were here, he would still be alive. We know you can heal him. But now that he's dead, it's all gone. More faith with limits. Believers not believing. And a lot of people believe that this is why we see what we see in these next verses. Look at, look at what we see here. 
Verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and was troubled. And said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Let's stop there just for a second. I want you to notice three times it talks about the emotion of Jesus. Verse 33, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Right? All of our young people know the shortest verse of the Bible. Verse 38, again being deeply moved within. This is emotional. This is almost Garden of Gethsemane, emotion, uh, 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 troubled. There's a lot of different opinions. A lot of people think that the trouble comes because, well, Lazarus is in a better place and he's got to bring him back to this world. Maybe that's some of it. But if we are like we are people of context, where is that context? It is all mingled in these statements of people Believers not believing in him. He has come to save the day and they think there's no hope. There's nothing more to do. Isn't it hard when even those that are close to you underestimate you? Don't have confidence in you? Notice some are like, well, what? He healed the blind man. Why couldn't he heal this man? You know, sometimes we look at things the way we want to look at things. Things that make sense to us. But sometimes God has a bigger purpose, a bigger plan. And here's that plan. Jesus let Lazarus die. Why? Not that people would question his ability, his powers, but people would see it and believe in it. It's not over yet. So verse 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the sea, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. There's that four days again, the fourth day. Jesus wanted to come on the fourth day. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you, if you believe you will see the glory of God? That's fascinating. Again, Martha's not getting it. She's not understanding. Jesus even told her, I'm here to raise your brother. But even in this, he says, did I not say to you that if you believe, and notice, what would we say? We'd say I'm going I'm to raise your brother. But he says it this way, you will see the glory of God. And so they remove the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I, I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! Imagine the, the chill that went through people as Jesus said this. Their eyes glued on the tomb. And the man who died came forth. The music is getting loud. We're almost at the crescendo. He came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. So Jesus what? Jesus does the impossible. And it's interesting, he prays. 
And it's almost a prayer, not for him and the Father, but he prays so that what? Others would hear it and, and make the connection. And what? He's, he's being deliberate. He's trying to build faith. Did it work? Well, like so many things, it does work on some. On others, it doesn't. Verse 45, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. And if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. Some didn't believe in him. Even seeing this great miracle. Not everyone is destined to great faith. But everyone has the ability and the choice to have great faith. But it takes understanding who Jesus truly is. What is his true purpose? And sometimes what keeps us from building that strong faith in getting that mature faith is Lazarus. I want to ask you, what is your Lazarus? And I use that in a figurative sense because what? Lazarus was their stumbling block. He was dead and nothing else could happen. But I want to ask you, what is your Lazarus? What is your, stands in your way of growing stronger in faith? I want to ask you, are you ready to take that next step? Of faith. I, I, I don't care if you've been in the church 50 years. If your faith has plateaued, you don't have faith in Christ. A, a lot of times people will, will, will say, Well, listen, I, I'm too old. I can't, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you might retire from your job, but I want to ask you, where in the Bible is the age to retire from God? From being a Christian, from serving Him. Now, you can grow and take that next step of faith. But are you going to let Lazarus stay in the tomb? Sometimes, like Jeremiah, well, I'm just too young. I don't know enough. And we need to understand that our young people are the next generation and they have incredible, incredible potential and incredible faith and incredible ability. And we need to develop that and encourage it and be there. See, yeah, talk to them when they say the wrong thing. It's a good thing when we were young, we didn't say the wrong thing. We wouldn't have any preachers or deacons or elders if people let young people think they're just too young. Something that a lot of people don't say, but it's the reality. I'm too busy. I'm just too busy. That's, that's shameful. You truly don't understand what faith in Jesus is all about. In other words, there's nothing that stands in Jesus' way to be the solution to your problems. Why should there be something that stands in your way to having that true, marvelous faith in Jesus? So let's finish on this. The resurrection and the life. Okay, i got two minutes to wrap this up. I, I talked about not believing in the resurrection life as we should. It, it, when we talk about the resurrection life, Jesus is the resurrection life. What does that mean for us today? And so often we're like Martha. Well, one day we're going to die and we're going to be resurrected. Is that what? The resurrection of the life is all about believing that Jesus is that. Well, that's part of it. 
There is that important future concept of that. But I want to ask you, what about today? Does believing that Jesus has the power to resurrect people to life, new life, have no bearing, no meaning in our life as Christians today? I want to ask you, what about the man that's dead because of drugs, alcohol, sexual immorality? I don't mean literally dead, I mean dead. His life has no meaning, no purpose. It is ruled by these things. Cannot Jesus raise up that dead life and give it purpose and give it meaning? He absolutely can. But too often we don't even try. We just say, well, it's impossible. Well, it may be impossible for us. But it's not impossible for Jesus. What about the dead, loveless marriage? You know, so many times even Christians just say, well, we'll just give up. We'll just give up. We'll just divorce. That's not understanding when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. If Jesus can raise a dead body in which there is no breath, He can raise a loveless marriage where there is no care and concern and love. But only if you believe it. Only if you understand it. What about the dead man? Dead in sin. Well, we understand that. That's Ephesians chapter 2. But sometimes we even struggle to understand that power to resurrect us from sin and the life of our trespasses. You see, what I want us to understand, brother, sister in Christ, is our belief that Jesus is the resurrection of life doesn't just begin when we die. It needs to impact us right now. I talked about the beginning that there's one exception that Lazarus is mentioned, and it's in the Gospel of Luke. And it's interesting that it's a story that Jesus tells, a parable, a story about the rich man. What's the name of the rich man? Don't know. Jesus very often never gives names. He talks about a shepherd. He talks about uh, a sower. He talks about uh, a fisherman. But here he talks about a rich man, no name, and a poor man. What's his name? Lazarus. He gives the poor man a name. And it just so happens to be Lazarus. And it just so happens to be a story where both of these men die the same day and in the afterlife they find their roles reversed. And Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham in comfort. And the rich man is very poor in torment. And you know the story, the, the rich man finally says to Abraham, send what? Lazarus back from the dead, that he may go to my brothers, that they will not come to this same place I'm at. And Abraham says, no. They have all that they need. They have... Moses and the law and the prophets. If they will not listen to that, the word of God, then they will not be persuaded if someone come back from the dead. And isn't it interesting that he gives that man Lazarus, that, that poor man, that name Lazarus. Is that just uh, uh, by circumstance? I don't think so. <laughs> Because in instance, in John chapter 11, God changes his mind and he sends Lazarus back. And what happens? Well, if you go over to chapter 12, not only do they now want to kill Jesus, 
not believing in him even after this great miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, but now they want to kill Lazarus. Abraham was right. Because faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. And if you're not going to build faith on the words of God, then it doesn't matter how many miracles you see. It doesn't matter how much evidence you see of God working in this world. It's not going to be enough. So let me ask you, I know you believe, but do you understand what it means when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life? Thank you.